How goes it? Preparations for the audience proceeding as planned. Yes, General. The gentleman will be more or less presentable. Who's this guy? He a barber too? No. Morvran Voris, commander of the Albert Division. Yennefer's escort. They were my men. All of them. Indeed, were. For none have returned to this year, have they? I truly wonder what happened on the road yesterday. Perhaps you could enlighten me. You have time. And a uh, razor to your throat. Welcome back to another Witcher lore video. I've decided to make today's video on Morvran Voorhees, which I think I'm actually saying correctly this time. But yeah, I really, really like this character, and I realised that I haven't done much on Nilfgaard, so I decided to do today's character video on this character. So to begin with, I just want to tell you all that in the books, Morvran is the actual canon successor to Emir. At least that's what Sapkowski states. So after the end of Emir's rule, Morvran ascends to the throne. But it's kind of strange because if you think about it, in the games there is an ending. In in which Ciri becomes Empress. So obviously this massively contradicts the books and kind of makes it a bit like, hmm. So I guess we could say that the ending where Ciri becomes Empress is definitely not canon in any sense of it. I mean, none of the endings are canon to the books because obviously the games and the books are separate entities, but if you were to go in the fact that, you know, if you were to follow exactly what the books say, then Siri would not be Empress. So anyway, that was just a question that I imagine a lot of you would have had, and I thought I'd try and answer it as best I can. So anyway, let's begin with the basic information. So Morvran is actually a relative of Emir through both maternal and paternal lines. So his position as his successor was always secured, as Emir, at least to everybody else's knowledge, never really had a child. I mean, obviously Siri is, but nobody really knew that. It wasn't exactly common knowledge. In fact, a lot of people in the books thought that he planned to marry her, or at least when fake Siri was there. After the end of his rule and his death, he was succeeded by Jan Kelviet, who I will actually go over in a later video, but that's just telling you how he all ends. So before becoming an emperor, Morvran was a well-established noble in Nilfgaard, being a member of both the Guild of Merchants and the commander of the Alba Division. His father, Prince Voorhees, made sure that he was a prominent member of Nilfgaardian nobility and the favour of the opposition. So that's just some very basic information, there's no need for me to go over his appearance, you can all see it, you'll get an idea just from seeing the pictures. So now I'm going to move on to his history, which is all the history we have on him from the books. It's not exactly known what his origins were or anything else like that, but it's pretty apparent that he was just born into a rich family then. These are the major events of his life, I suppose you could say. At least the ones that affect the story. So in the year 1268, when Morvran was still a child, Joachim de Wet, Ardal Eip de Hay, Count de Arvi, Berenger Luvarden, Stefan Skellen and Count Brione planned to overthrow Emir and replace him with someone they could use as a puppet. They originally planned to put Morvran's father on the throne, but instead decided that they could more easily control his son, Morvran. But before they could put their plan into action, they were betrayed by Luvarden and were all sentenced to death. Skip forward a few years and Tybor Egebracht dies. A little time later, Morvran is appointed as the commander of an armoured Alba division and also joins Berengar Luvarden's Guild of Merchants. With this new high-ranking position, his social status goes up. He eventually becomes the most important general during the Third Northern War. So after rising through the ranks and becoming more and more prominent, being a very, very well-known general, being intelligent, being in a high position in Nilfgaardian nobility, having pure Nilfgaardian lines. He eventually becomes, I suppose you could say, almost like Emir's favourite. He Emir uses him for a lot of tasks that he considers very important. So one of these tasks you actually see in the games. So in 1272, Morvran gave up some of his men to escort Yennefer on her mission to find Geralt. Whilst escorting both the Witcher and the Sorceress back to occupied Vizima, they were killed by a wild hunt ambush, leaving only Geralt and Yennefer alive. Morvran then interviewed the surviving Witcher on his past events and helped prepare him for his meeting with Emir. So during this time, you know, during this war, Morvran used his free time to visit Baroness Lavalette in her villa and on occasion go and see the races near the Vagelbud residence. In fact, he actually meets the Witcher Geralt at the Lavalette residence and then goes to watch the races with him, at least depending on what you choose. So a few years later, Morvran ascends the throne of Nilfgaard. 
and during this time, he convicted Peter Everste, who was the former Imperial Treasurer and Chief Chamberlain of the Army. He was eventually released and rehabilitated by Morvran's successor, but this was something Morvran was known for, and it was a little controversial. Morvran eventually became known for saying he could win a war without a single sword. And this wasn't just him being overconfident or arrogant, there was actually a lot of truth in this, as Morvran's strategy involved him using spies and saboteurs. Even though this might not be considerably honourable, it did earn him many victories. He was known not to recognise any rules in warfare. To defeat his enemies, he was willing to make alliances with anyone, be that war criminals, rebellious mages, or even sometimes renegade witches. The only thing that mattered to him was victory. So he was actually very, very intelligent with using his spies, and he kept tabs on all his enemies' activities. So you may be wondering how he did this, because a lot of his enemies would have included very important people that wouldn't just allow anybody into their homes. So he did this by writing lengthy letters, which contained a lot of drivel and pretty much no information at all. But the main purpose for this was that the emissaries that he sent to deliver these letters would keep their eyes wide open while being in the enemy's base or home. And then later they would report back to him, giving him the information he needed. Eventually, he cultivated a large array of skilled spies, to work on the Empire's behalf of course, as well as some special Nausicaa Brigade officers who were devoted to dealing with agents foolish enough to betray the Empire. He did, however, eventually die in 1301, and altogether he reigned for 11 years. So anyway, that's pretty much his full history, or at least everything we know, but I'm now going to read the journal entry and then the developer's comments. Morvran Voorhees, commander of the Alba Division, an officer of the highest rank and pure-blooded aristocrat, one who with pride could call himself a Nilfgaardian, a designation truly deserved only by the native-born inhabitants of the Empire's capital, and its immediate surroundings. At the time of their first meeting, Geralt had no idea what an important person had been assigned to the task of asking him a few routine questions. Knowing the Witcher, however, knowledge of Morvran's rank and status would not have made much difference. The Witcher encountered Voorhees again sometime later in Novigrad. There, the Nilfgaardian general was taking advantage of the city's neutral status to enjoy the company of Baroness Louise Lavalette. Developer's comments. Morvran Voorhees is a true Nilfgaardian, a title rightfully applied only to those born in the core lands of the Empire. This young, promising officer is the scion of an ancient Imperial family, and many see in him a possible candidate for the Imperial throne. Voorhees dresses after the Nilfgaardian style, meaning he limits his clothing to a colour palette consisting of black and gold. This drawing shows an early design for the character, one whose task was to convey Morvran's overall nature, proud, aware of his high rank and what it entails, and equally comfortable on the battlefield or in courtly salons. And for trivia, Morvran's name means the ugliest one in Welsh. Anyway guys, that's the end of today's video. I hope you've all learned something new. If this video could get, I don't know, 500 likes, that'd be honestly amazing. That'd be really cool if you guys could manage that. So everyone, please click the like button as these videos take a long time to make and it's really cool if you do that. If this is the first video you're finding on my channel, be sure to click subscribe. I do Witcher lore videos every other day and the next Witcher lore video should probably be a Witcher Guilds video, so look forward to that. As always, be sure to follow me on Twitter as I do polls every other Friday. In fact, this Friday is the one that I'm going to be doing the poll in which I ask you guys which fandom you want me to cover in a random fandom lore video, so if you follow me on there you can get your say. And also I post updates on there for videos and you can chat to me on there if you want to and send me stuff that you've made or stuff that you like. So be sure to go and follow me on there. Also be sure to follow me on Twitch, I plan to stream some more games on there soon, I've been very very busy, but if you follow me on there you'll get the notification for when I stream, and honestly it doesn't really mean much, you don't even have to watch it if you get the notification, but be sure to go and follow there. Also be sure to join the Discord, we have over 300 people on there now, we all talk about The Witcher pretty much all day, there's people on there all the time, you can join there, post your in the art section, that could be screenshot stuff you've drawn, you can do Gwent challenges in the Gwent challenge section, just Witcher chat in the normal chat section where you can just talk to people, and yeah, it's pretty cool. And as always, a big thank you to the Patreon pledges, you guys are awesome, thank you so much, thank you for donating, it's awesome that you guys do that, it really really helps with the channel and you're seriously just all so cool. If you want to become a Patreon pledger, just go down to the links in the description, that's where everything is that I've talked about in this outro, you can get anything from that area, you can donate a dollar, you can donate as much as you want, and the more you donate, the higher up you are on the list of names at the end. So be sure to donate if you want to get your name at the end of every video, if you want to get the rank of Grandmaster, if you want to know what videos are a day earlier and get access to the high-res thumbnails. So yeah, if you want to donate, be sure to go to that in the description. Anyway guys, I'll see you all later. Thank you all so much. Leave a comment or something. Tomorrow should be an Oblivion part, so I look forward to recording some of that. I love doing that. And I'll see you all later. Have an awesome rest of the week.